So we've been on this series just talking about grow on a number of areas that God is calling us to grow in. And so if you haven't heard those two sermons or the New Year's Eve sermon, I recommend you go back and listen to them. Amen. Now we are in this same verses, Acts 2, 42 to 47. I'll read them for you again today. And it says this in the ESV version of the Bible. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, community, and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple, don't stop going to church in Jesus' name, together, and breaking bread in their homes, community, Somebody with me today? They received their food with glad and generous hearts. I always receive food with a glad heart. Amen. I am in line with the Bible. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Wouldn't you like to have favor with everybody? Y'all gotta get y'all gotta catch this. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Those who were being saved. A number of years ago, I went to Massachusetts for a prayer gathering of individuals who would globally host 10 days of prayer throughout the world. We had folks from like India and England there, and it was, it was really, really cool. And it was, it was kind of cool, but it was like weird cool because it was just like we didn't have an agenda. We had a couple of people scheduled to speak, and I was one of them. didn't know why I was there to speak. Um, but we had times of prayer and worship where it just blurred all the lines of who was who, and we all became one. Have you ever been in a moment of worship? where it's so powerful and so tangible, the presence of God, that you're able to just begin to to, to blend hearts with people around you, and you're able to just, you don't know what it is exactly, but you know that God is doing something in the room, and it's hard to describe the moments that we had in Massachusetts, or, or maybe sometimes you've had them at your house with some friends and family, or maybe you've had them, you know, I've had them in my backyard with a bunch of worshipers, where we just started worshiping around the campfire, and it was just an amazing time of worship, or I've had them here on some of our midweek services, where the presence of God just drops, and you walk in the room, I remember I came up late about a year year ago to a worship service happening here and I didn't know what happened it was like a glory bomb went off and I was about it was about 10 minutes into the service and people were strewn all over the sanctuary laid out and I'm like oh they're not waiting the day just going after the glory but in those moments of intimacy with God where there is not just community but communal prayer something begins to transact in the spirit that we can't even begin to describe sometimes And you don't need nobody to pray for you. God just be doing stuff. And then somebody gets up on stage and they seem to talk directly to your spirit. And they're talking to everything that you've been struggling with. And everyone in the room feels the exact same way. And they took the message a hundred different ways. But God healed everybody's needs that night. He met everybody that night. I've had those moments with God in corporate prayer. And let me tell you something. It's extremely hard, difficult, and Close to impossible to have those same moments by yourself. It's not the same thing. You can't go back and say, remember that time? There is a power in communal prayer. I'm going to say that again. There is a power in communal prayer. It's one thing to build up your prayer life. It's another thing to build up the church's prayer culture. It's one thing to go in your prayer closet and seek the Lord to intercede. It's a whole other ball game to actually get up and spend some time with other people praying and seeking the Lord. I want to talk to you today for a few minutes about the power of a praying church. A church that knows how to pray and seek the Lord together. What would a church look like that was consumed with the word of God, deeply fellowshipping in love, and then also not just eating together, but praying together? What a church that would be that would not just go for services on Sunday, but would not think it robbery to be in communal prayer with one another throughout the week. Less amens on that part. We've been on this verse now for three weeks, and I've I stated every week, these are like a blueprint for the church of Jesus Christ. 
We're going to continue on these verses for the next two weeks. But the early church, when I say the early church, that terminology, all it means is the the beginnings of the church. When the church was born in Acts chapter 2, up until that point, it was just a a couple of people, a bunch of people in a room praying. The Holy Spirit comes. He invades on the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit blows the place up. Peter is filled with the Spirit. He preaches in the streets, and 3,000 people are saved, and now they got a church. Talk about church planting. And then they begin to meet in the temple courts. They meet in various synagogues. And then they begin to meet in their homes as the apostles are teaching and instructing them. They're taking that word home with them. You should be taking sermons from Sunday home with you, meditating on the word of God. It's the word for the week for the house. It's something that you should take into your heart. And that's what they're doing. And then they're meeting together. They're breaking bread together. And then we see that they begin to pray together. I, I don't know about you. Our hearts should long for a Acts chapter 2 type church. Our hearts should long that we're not just looking for Sunday morning experiences, but that we're looking for the presence and the glory of God to permeate the house of God and the people of God. And it's not just going to come through a Sunday morning experience. It's going to come through a communal effort of the body of Christ committing to one another as much as we're committing to Christ. That I commit to love my brother and my sister and be in in fellowship and do life with them. And I know that for the past couple of weeks, it's been hard for you introverts. Talking about community. Talking about friendships. Talking about being nice to people. Talking about smiling more. Talking about not thinking bad about people. You know, not hiding in your home. Not just doing bedside baptism every Sunday and checking the box, went to church. Good word while you're wearing your booties at home and stuff. Cooking breakfast, listening to worship, but committing time to the family. The family of God. It's different. We as believers should long to see God move then as he did now and it's not a formula we can we can sit here and just like oh if we do these three things god will do this that's not how it works but we should always posture ourselves in a place where god is able to do whatever he wants to do now starting in verse 42 we see the church doing these things and and they're doing great things at the end of verse 43 we see the third thing they do is the church prays together If we took a a look across the book of Acts, we quickly see that corporate and communal prayer was an intentional focus of the early church. It was not this peripheral issue, meaning it wasn't like a side thing. It was the thing amongst other the things. It was all kind of one thing. That inside of community, there was food, prayer, the word, and fellowship where they actually deeply love one another. If I digress for 30 seconds to let you know that I'm aware now that for over seven years, we've talked about prayer in our church on a regular rhythm every single year. Bob Sorge described in, in one of his books that prayer is like the immune system of the church. The importance of prayer cannot be overspoken in a church you have to understand how important this is and my hope is that today you don't check out because you're like well i've heard enough about prayer but that you would make a commitment in your heart not to your prayer life but to our prayer life our communal approach to prayer my hope is that you move from a head knowledge of prayer to a heart knowledge of prayer where you are able to actually not just talk about it but actually do it in your life Now, we know that prayer in and of itself is important, but I want to focus today not on individual prayer, but on communal prayer. If you're new to church, prayer at its simple basis is your communication to God, whether it's you listening to God or it's you bringing petitions to God. If you're praying for somebody else, that's called intercession when you're lifting someone else's needs and burdens up. It's one thing to have your needs, your petitions, your prayer life, but it's another thing to be able to lift up other people in the church. And we see the apostles, even in Acts chapter 3, they were walking to the temple in the time of prayer. They actually kept in rhythm with the Jewish prayer times. 
They would pray multiple times a day in the temple. And, and, and we see this constantly, that they were on their way to pray. Simultaneously, Acts 2.42 tells us that they didn't just pray in the temples. They actually prayed one with another. They took intentional time to pray and meet in the homes and seek the Lord as a corporate body. A portion of their community time was committed to prayer and drawing near to God. Now, there is no way to properly pray and not walk out closer to God. There's no way to properly pray and not walk out closer to God. And that doesn't mean that God gives you all the answers you want. You just come to more peace that he's going to do it, even if he hasn't told you how. Are you committed to a corporate style of prayer? Where we gather as a church, whether in a midweek prayer service or in private areas, where you can gather and deepen your relationship, not just with God, but with others. Because something begins to happen in actual community prayer when you're praying for other people, that you begin to have a burden for other people. Your love for them grows. Here's point number one, that communal or corporate prayer produces deeper relationships. It's going to produce a deeper relationship, not just with you and God, but with you and other people. The first thing to understand about the power of a praying church is that they pray together and they pray for one another. It produces this love and concern for the one who is next to you because as you pray their petition, you are burdened on your heart for the circumstances of their life. Some of you Christians need to listen to me today, online, in-house, listen to me. You who have a new problem with somebody in every season and call yourself a daughter or a son of God, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 19 to 21, you cannot call yourself a Christian if you hate your brother. The light is not in you. If you have problems with other Christians, the light of God is not in you. He says that. Well, how do I remedy that, Pastor? If you sincerely pray for somebody, there's no way you can come out on the other side of that prayer time and hate that person because they are on your heart as a burden to lift up to God. The more you pray for somebody, the more you lift them up to God, you are lowering and humbling yourself and putting them first. And the Bible says that Jesus came to serve, not be served. So maybe the way to get over your issues with other people you constantly have is to actually pray for them. And not from this standpoint, oh, Lord, pray for Sister Vicky. She has issues with pride. Pray for Malachi. He got a mean mug face all the time. He must have an attitude. Pray for Gary. The dude thinks he's so cool because he hangs out with Pastor a lot. Uh, pray, for, pray for Richard. I always bother Richard apparently. But pray for Richard because he thinks he's too great. It's, it's more like, Lord, it's Lord, do you see the need that Jew has? Would you meet that need, Father God? Lord, I pray for every area of her life that she needs that thing. God, would you meet her need? God, I pray that you would give me eyes to see them the way you see them, God. See, you can tell someone lacks prayer life when they start gossiping. People who gossip don't have a prayer life. They might have a personal prayer life where they pray for themselves because gossipy people are prideful people, and they only think of themselves as worthy of praying for. But when you have somebody who truly cares about a brother or sister in Christ, and genuinely lifts them up. There's no way to walk away from that moment of prayer. And if you've got a problem with them, be like, I can't stand Gary still. <laughs> there's, no, dude, there's just no way to get before God and sincerely pray for people and then walk away and be like, I still don't like them. It's, it's, it's impossible. But when you genuinely pray, this is why I'm telling you that corporate and communal prayer, it actually deepens relationships. Because you leave, when you begin to pray for Sister Penny, and you leave, and a oh, penny's on my heart. All week, I'm going to text you in the morning. How you doing, Penny? I, has God done it yet? Jesus. Does that make sense, y'all? Yeah. That you, you pray it from a place of, Lord, would you do it for them? And it's not about you. It's about that individual. Yeah. In communal prayer, that's where we bear one another's burdens, as Paul tells us to. It's also where we draw near to God. Psalms 145, 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Don't cry woof to God. Pray in truth. 
Don't pray from your emotions. Pray from truth. It's from truth that you find freedom in God. When you draw near unto him. When we draw near to God, we can pray and seek the Lord and we draw near unto him. But as we pray for others, we also draw near to them. As we draw near to them, it deepens our sense of community. It's no wonder that in the church when there's prayerlessness, there's less community. Y'all don't want to hear that. When, when I ask people stuff like, you know, how's your prayer life? The, 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 the mo I get the same answer. I don't care who you are. I get the same answer every single time. You know, I pray, but it's just not, I, I can do better. It's not where it needs to be. There's room for improvement. It's the same, the same answer, seven different variations. But most of us understand the depth and the need for prayer. And then we have the real deep people, Gary. I, I pray without ceasing. I pray all day long. I, I cry out to God while I'm at work in my computer, just shout out every now and then, hallelujah, glory to God. And, and nobody likes me at work. I can't understand why, but... But we have the deep people, the overly deep people, but are you really praying for one another? Is, is there a way to lift up one another? Not too long ago, I was, I was, a sister in the church calls me, and she says, um, hey, pastor, I want to tell you something before anybody else tells you. And I'm like, okay. And she listens. I'm listening to her. I'm expecting some, some crazy news. And she gives me crazy news that she's been diagnosed with a serious disease, and she has to go for an immediate surgery. And instantly, I'm in my car, and I'm just weeping. And I'm just thinking like, God, no, not this person, Lord. And I'm praying over them and, and I'm checking on them. How are you doing today? You're going to be all right. Don't worry. We have your back. We love you. Because when you share your burden, there's no way to walk away from that person. who you if, you if somebody can share a sincere burden on their heart and you walk away with no impression on your heart for them, there's such a callousness in your heart that no impression can be made. And the way we remedy that is by getting before the fire of the Lord in prayer and lifting up one another. Beloved, you cannot hate or dislike people in church. You cannot dislike people. Every issue of jealousy, misconduct, gossip, discourse. Some of you are texting each other right now. You're going to text each other during the sermon. Hmm. You, you little, some of y'all, listen. If you got an Apple phone and your friends do too, just rename the group chat Demonic. Ooh. Rename it Demonic Sisterhood of, of, of just gossipy people. Brothers who are going to lead me into sin, like just don't even do it no more. There's no way to talk about God's children and be in community. There's such a, such a discord and two-facedness of the church these days where you would smile in people's face but screenshot stuff and send it to people. Y'all don't want to hear that kind of truth today. A bunch of gossips to stop. We have to get to a place where we're like, you know what? I just want to love you. That no matter what you do to me, I'm just going to love you because that's what Christ tells me to do. Are you with me? I've been challenging some of those screenshots. I don't know if that's, I don't, I don't know if this is God. Should we talk to this person? Should we bring them into this conversation? Because on Apple, you can add them. Should we add someone to this conversation? I, I don't know if I want to know this information because I want to love them the way Jesus loves them to be able to abide in community. How can you hate somebody and carry them in your heart for prayer? So if you just choose to pray for them, you can't hate them. Oh, yeah, I, I just set somebody free, I'm telling you. Jesus said this, right? If you hold to my teachings and you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Most of us say, if you know the truth, the truth is that you're free. You forget the first part. If you hold fast to my teachings. Hold on to these teachings from the Lord in his word that teach us to, to not talk about one another, but to pray for one another. In prayer, we minister one to another. We hear the heart of people who love God. We hear the heart of people who are just as wounded as us. Because here's the truth. At some point in our life, we were all messy. I'm going to give you a chance to say amen to that again. Because I'm in that category. At one point in our life, we were all messy. 
But when we come before the Lord into community, we can bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 2, right? Where Paul tells them, bear one another's burdens, so fulfilling the law of Christ. Here's the law of Christ, that I bear your burdens. Like the guy Simon who carried the cross of Jesus, bear one another's burdens. In corporate and communal prayer, we develop a deeper relationship with God and with his body. We don't use these moments of prayer to bash people. We don't overshare. Somebody say amen. amen. We don't sit there and do that kind of stuff. We genuinely lift them up for their edification. For their edification. When's the last time that you sincerely sat with a number of people and just said, hey, how can I pray for you this week? I want to carry you on my heart this week. How can I lift you up? It's through prayer that our relationships are deepened with one another. And I, I, can, I can say this of, of my own life, that every time I recognized my prayer life was, was like waning in the places that it should have been strengthening, it was weakening, I realized that there was less and less community in my life. But the more community I had, the more I wanted to lift up the people that I was filling my life with. That I wanted to pray for them. I wanted the best for them. The power of a praying church is that they deeply love one another and they exhibit it through prayer with no guile in their hearts, no negative motives. Is that it, Pastor? Well, no, by no means. That's not just it. There's more to it, right? Listen to verse 43. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Here's point number two that you should really, really take to heart. That communal prayer produces a corporate fear of the Lord. Oh, y'all got to hear this today. Communal prayer, it produces a corporate fear of the Lord. Now, if you're new to church and you hear fear of the Lord, I'm not talking about being afraid of God. I'm talking about like your father. If you had a dad in your life, you had a healthy respect and a fear of your dad. You weren't going to say certain things to dad because dad would have backhanded you to the middle of next week. Some of you have a healthy fear for your mother's. And you know that you would have said something wrong and mama will pop you outside your face. <laughs> Not even your head. It was your face. All this new, don't hit the kid in the face. Somebody should have told my mom that. <laughs> my face and her hand were very well acquainted. <laughs> I was definitely a mouthy kid. And, but man, I'm telling you, when you see nowadays some of these children the way they are with their parents, there's no reverence for their parents. In many Puerto Rican circles, especially when we grew up, you have to walk into a room and greet your elders before you do anything. You walk in with a reverence and a respect. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about. That nowadays in the church, we kind of lack a fear of the Lord that used to happen when there was a strong community of believers. Because here's what happens. When nobody knows what your life is really like, you can hide all day long. You can come in before God's presence any old way you want with no type of conviction and your mind is seared. You think it's all good and you're walking before God's presence and you're saying this, at least I came to God's house. But there has to be a healthy fear of the Lord. If I can be brutally honest with you, I feel like we're living in a time where the fear of the Lord is fading. That many people don't have a healthy fear Fear of the Lord. Another way to look at the fear of the Lord is to have an awe of God. There's, everybody maybe has that person in your, in your life where you won't be as crazy around. I get that a lot with people when they come around me and they say a bad word and they're not from church. Maybe they are. And they're like, oops, my bad. That's the reverence they have. Right? Do we have that reverence for God? We come before God any old kind of way and we say, but I got grace. We call God every catchy new thing that everybody else and their mother's saying to him. And we just say all these cutesy things to God. And God's like, do you have a reverence for me? Because even though I love my dad and I can go to my dad any old kind of way, I would not say any old kind of thing to my dad. My father was a man who I highly respected. I didn't even know his name until I was like 11 years old. He was dad. This new trend on, on, on these, these kids with TikTok and YouTube. I'm going to go call my parents their name. What? I, I wouldn't be here to preach if I did that. I wouldn't have had no teeth. 
reverence your parents, right? How much more God? We can't come to church any kind of way. We can't, the saints cannot keep on backbiting or talking about one another or living these lives of complete, like, like compromise and sin and then come to church on a Sunday and give God lip service. Coming into the house of God with no fear of the Lord as if God is lucky that we're present here. You see, the issue is you don't have a reverence because you don't have a community. When you have community, people hold you accountable to your walk with the Lord. It's a, it's a sense of God's presence that you're like, you know, I don't want to mess this up. Have you ever been in God's presence and nobody is preaching about anything, but you know you got some sin up in your life? Nobody done said nothing to you. And all of a sudden, you are self-aware of a time a week ago where you were lusting after somebody or you were watching something God wouldn't have wanted you to watch or you were talking about somebody that you should have been talking about. The presence of God will convict you. There have been times where I've walked into this place. Words can't describe the presence that was here. And God just began to speak to me about things that were wrong with my life. I'm like, all right, Lord, I'm going to work on these things. Because when you have a fear of the Lord, you reverence God's presence. In those moments, you just lay low before God. Sometimes I just stayed still, wouldn't say nothing, ain't nothing to say. The worship team's sitting there waiting for me. Danny's giving me the eye, like, you can come up now. I'm just like, no. Or, or somebody, yo, Yoshi's like, I'm like, no, I'm just going to lay here right here and be dead in the spirit. Because in God's presence, you don't have to move sometimes. Just let him work. Let him do it in your life. There have been times in my in my life where the Lord's presence has fallen down and all I want to do is, is, is be in awe of him. Yes. Nowadays, you see people just on their phones in church, no reverence, no respect. We teach our kids to be distracted in church. They come prepared to be distracted. Rather than, I remember when I was a kid, just they taught me how to pray instead. Taught me how to seek the Lord. When did the presence become something that we just took for granted? When did we lose that sense of awe and reverence for the Lord? There was times where the presence would rip through the room and every single person was laid out on a 10 days of prayer night. Or a midweek service. The Bible says that when they prayed, all came upon every soul. That as the church got into community and they began to pray, there was a tangible presence in the room that they began to be in awe of. It's that consciousness that God is working in the room and my heart needs to be still and I don't need to say anything. And all of a sudden, somebody knows what I'm talking about. People start whimpering all over the sanctuary. Sister so-and-so's crying. Then the piano player falls over. He's crying. You don't know why people are crying, but you know God is there. You see, you see this, you just people covering your face. I know what you're doing behind there. It's the presence, you're crying. But there's an awe of the presence of God and nobody wants to move because God is present. You with me so far, you catching this? The Bible says that it's in communal prayer that this is produced. It would behoove us as believers and if we did not take and say, you know what, then I want to be a part of communal prayer if that's what's produced in my life. That the presence comes and I have a healthy awe of God's presence and a fear of the Lord. How we need to return to the place of being in awe of God. Having that fear of the Lord in fellowship with other people. The scripture tells us that in communal prayer, in fellowship, awe and fear of the Lord fell upon every single individual. The power of a praying church is that they walk in the fear of the Lord. And in the fear of the Lord, there is a, a radical change of life. Where you're not playing games with God. Where you're not sitting here one foot in, one foot out. Where you're not sitting there sinning all week long and coming to church for a shower of grace every Sunday morning. But you are actually in community with people and growing step by step with people loving them, caring about them, deeply loving them, and, hurt, and hurting when they hurt, and, and, and rejoicing when they rejoice, and when they get blessed, you're not jealous, you're not, God, what about me? You're more like, yes, God. I, I'm Puerto Rican, and I love to support any Hispanic business who does it right. I like to support any minority business. I like to support any local businesses. 
For many years, we wouldn't do business as a church with large companies. If there's a local business who can get the job done right at a reasonable rate, let's support local. Right? There's a bagel shop in, in Trumbull called J Bagels. We get our bagels there now for in the morning. There, God, the Holy Spirit is there. In the bagels. Some of the best bagel sandwiches, they've been taking all of my money. But I, it's, it's a 16-minute drive from my house, and I don't even care. It's a beautiful Hispanic bagel shop. I don't care. I'm going to go. I am going to go. I can cut it down to 14 if I'm really hungry. <laughs> but how much more should we rejoice? See, I rejoice when our people, right, when I see our people excelling in business. We should all rejoice. How much more should we rejoice when sister so-and-so is blessed? Right? When the salon takes off, how much more should we be like, praise the Lord? When the plumbing business takes off, when the, when the real estate thing just starts booming, how much more should we rejoice? You can't rejoice with those you don't love. It'll always turn to more like, well, what about me, God? You got to love them. You got to deeply care about them. You won't be sitting there going home. <laughs> why, did, why did Gary get a house, Lord, and I'm still in an apartment, and I've been faithful? It's like, what? Where's the community? Where's the love? Right? The power of a praying church is they walk together in this fear of the Lord that causes them to not only have a reverence for God, but then you begin to reverence one another because you have a deeper relationship. And you understand the complexities of people. And here's what you understand, that at some point in the world, we're all weird. All y'all have quirks. Right? All y'all have that. All y'all have something wrong with you. I do too. And the more you hang out with them, you see those flaws. And here's the thing about people who can be in my life. If you can't handle my humanity, you might not be, be able to handle everything about my life. If you can't come and break bread with me and then think different, if you see I do something different than you, and oh, I can't be at that church, you know what he does? Well, then don't come to my house. Because I ain't going to I, I, I sit there and be fake. I'm not going to bring a representative. I'm going to be me. But that's community. You should have that with individuals in the house. In those moments, right? It deepens our relationships. And here's a part that most of you do not do, but you need to. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I, listen, there's a power of living in communal confession of, of sins. Y'all don't want to hear that. Oh, yeah. Sister Sharon, the, the saints don't want to hear that one. There is a power, y'all, when you get together and say, hey, by the way, you know what I've been struggling with? I got to bring this to somebody. Some of y'all, I confess to God. There is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Catholic Church got it all jacked up. Well, they do, but we have to confess one to another. Well, why? Why do we confess one to another? Because when we do, what it does is it allows for us to see, oh, it's not just me. I can carry your burden too. I can carry what you're carrying because I'm struggling with the same thing. You know what? You should talk to so-and-so because they, they overcame that very thing. You should be able to reach out to this person because they overcame that. And now we become a network of people helping us, each other, overcome. So communal prayer, but then inside of communal prayer, confessional living. Not once a week, like not once a month rather, but maybe like once a week. Like, you know, I'm, I'm doing a little better, but I still struggled. Yes. And if people are going to talk about you because you struggle, you're in good company. They talked about Jesus, and he wasn't even struggling. They talk about everybody. But I want to challenge you that God is looking for the church to be communal in our confession. That God is looking for the church to have a time of prayer that is communal, that brings the fear of the Lord, that makes us say, oh, I can't carry this by myself. God's convicted me. I got to talk to so-and-so about it. I need prayer in this area. That's the power of a praying church, that you're in wonder and awe of God, and you're in confessional relationship with other people, that you're able to say, I have an issue. The, the, the more you keep that issue internally, the enemy binds you up in your own mess. A prisoner of your own mind. A prisoner of your own proclivity where you are chained up by chains of your choosing because you don't want to be set free by, by opening up and humbling yourself saying, I got an issue. 
in community, we all have issues. It's just a matter of time before we find them out. So I'm going to tell you in advance. I've got an issue. Here's point number three. I close with this, right? I'll recap. In communal prayer, we deepen our relationships both with God and one another. And secondly, in communal prayer, we, we maintain a healthy fear of the Lord, not just as a corporate body, but on an individual level that leads us then to a confessional lifestyle where we confess our sins one to another. But there's another layer. There's one more layer to this, and we see it continuously in the scripture, but we also see it in Acts 2.43. And all came upon every soul. Talk about when they were praying. And many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. We see that every time in the early church, every time the church got together to pray, there was a release of miracles and there was a release of the power of God. It wasn't worship. It wasn't preaching that brought the power. It was prayer. Actually seeking the Lord. Here's point number three, that in communal prayer, God releases provision and power, right? Communal prayer releases provision and power. Provision to meet the needs of others and power to meet, right, the the expectations of the world to see a powerful God. God sends that. Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, what were they doing when the power hit? They were praying. Acts chapter 4, right? When they're sitting there and they're being persecuted and the Bible says the disciples begin to pray again and the building shook that they were in and they were all filled all over again. Acts 3, it was Peter and John on the way to pray where power was released. Acts 16, where, 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 where the apostles were there praying and the Bible says that 13 rather, they were released into the missionary field through the power of prayer where God gave prophetic insight on what to do. We're talking about prayer. Inside of prayer, God only, he doesn't only just give you answers, he gives you power. And then he gives you the grace and the provision of grace to do what he said you should do. He gives you the power, he gives you the grace. It's in communal prayer that we see this. Don't run from midweek prayer. Y'all, don't run from midweek prayer. Don't stop inviting friends to pray at your house with you. In Acts 16, again, it was communal prayer of Paul and Silas. There were two or three are gathered, Pastor Mary, just two. Make a majority with God. You and and somebody else, the presence, the kingdom is there. And they began to praise God. They turned their shackles into a shout. They turned their chains into a change in their demeanor. And they began to praise God. And the Bible says that as they worshiped at midnight, and I love that because it was the darkest time of night, but it marked a new day, that at that time they began to sing and pray and praise God. And the Bible says that the, an earthquake hits the jail. But I love when it says everybody's chains came loose. You're you're telling me that that even though somebody else ain't praying, I can get before God and and shake the room so much on a midweek prayer, even though everybody else is like a lump on a log, I can get before God and I can pray and I can bring the house down and I can get with somebody else touching the grief and others will be set free as the community is praying together and all the other people are just spectating you because the Bible says in Acts 16, they were watching Paul and Silas. You're telling me that my prayer can set somebody else free? That my praise of God can break the chains of somebody else? Yes. Communal prayer releases provision and power. The provision of grace to get through the week. The provision of power to walk in the spirit. To see the blind receive their sight. To see the lame man healed by your touch. I want to challenge you. Make a commitment to engage in communal prayer this year. God is calling you to grow in communal prayer this year. To recommit to pray with us as a church on Wednesdays. To recommit to pray with other people throughout the week. And not have a gossip fest at your house. But to have a prayer time. Where the power of God is filled. In your life. Flowing. Let me tell you something. I'll close with this. If you, meet, if you missed this past midweek, you missed a lot. You, you missed a lot. We began to pray and worship. It was one of those days a glory bomb went off. And Danny got up and she, man, she preached a word. 
she gave an, an exhortation, a 15-minute homily. But what a word it was, a word of breakthrough. And the worship began to get behind the breaking of the ground, and all of a sudden, I love Stephen and Yoshi, they were watching from home, and Stephen said he was struggling with a headache all day. And as he was worshiping and praying and watching, his headache began to dissipate. And he, he had an urgency to run into the presence of God. And he, him and his wife got the baby together, and they came running in the church. It was about 8 o'clock. We were about 20 minutes from ending, but they counted it not robbery. They were running in. After service, we were getting reports of people being healed who nobody prayed for, but the presence of God was in the place. Somebody who came in with pain in their legs walked out with no pain. Woo! Sister Sharon, you better praise them. Yes. When the church gets together to pray, yes. Yes. you pull on something that by yourself you can't do. That in and of yourself you don't got. Which is why he says we're two or three. Where there's communal prayer. There's such a presence. So, oh, pastor, are you saying that when I pray by myself, God ain't there? No, don't be foolish. But there's something in community prayer. Man, this past Wednesday, I left there, and I was in my car. My like, God, the presence was in awe. And I'll be honest with you. I have been wrestling with anxiety for almost 10 days, and my wife is my witness. I had not slept in nearly 10 days rightly. Sleep for an hour up to 4 or 5 in the morning. I'm like, Lord, what is going on? I was doing everything. I was praying by myself at night, singing. My wife prayed over me, reading the word, doing all the faithful things. But, man, midweek came, and, and, and I'm telling you, something broke in my spirit. In community, in communal prayer, I woke up the next day. I slept so hard, I didn't even know who I was. It was a good sleep. And I woke up, what am I doing here? What, what is this bedroom? Where, where am I at? Had, had like next level just like rest and then the next night just knocked out couldn't even keep myself up the next day I took a power nap I didn't know what was wrong with me I was so tired I took a nap about for an hour and a half and I literally woke up and this kid was waking me up oh I had never seen before in my life with my daughter Aria and I'm just like who is this and what are you bothering me for it was such a deep sleep such a deep rest because where there's communal prayer there's breakthrough with this communal prayer, you're trying to do it by yourself. You were not called to walk this walk by yourself. Hallelujah. Stop running in and out of church and realize there are people here who can bear the weight of your burden. People you can lean on. People you can rejoice with. Come on, stand with me. I don't know about you. There's got to be a shift in our hearts towards communal prayer. And here's what this is not. This is not me just hyping up midweek service. This is me telling you that you absolutely, 100%, unequivocally need community prayer in your life. And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you both here and online. God is calling you to prayer this year in a way that you have not experienced before. And that if you would commit to that time of prayer, you would see the breakthrough that you've been looking for. See, you can hear a sermon like this and discount it, but obedience is where God is looking to see those who would take the word he has spoken and put action behind it. And in that, you're going to begin to see absolute breakthrough in your life. Come on, let's bow our heads. Oh, I, don't, I don't want to assume that every single person in this room knows Jesus, and maybe you don't know God as Jesus, rather, as your Lord and Savior. If you want to make that commitment today, I want to tell you that God loves you. That no matter what you've done, he can absolutely change your life. Doesn't matter, both here and online, doesn't matter what the condition of your life is. If that's you, you're saying, I want to make a commitment to Christ today. Would you lift your hand as high as you can? Thank you. Come on, as high as you can, as high as you can. Praise God. We got one right now. Come on, anybody else? Two. Thank you so much. I see you in the back over there. Thank you. If you want to give your heart to God, it's what, this is what it's all about, church. Seeing people come to the Lord. Father, let's pray right now. Repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to accept your son Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I believe in my heart. I confess it with my mouth. 
that Jesus is Lord. I receive the forgiveness he offers. Make me into a new creation. Right here, right now. And give me the grace to walk with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, after service, right in the front here, we're going to have people who are ready to take some information from you. We want to help you walk this walk in community with others. Amen. I want to pray over the rest of you really quickly. I want to bless you guys because I know that hearing a sermon like this and hearing last week, community is hard. It's not always the easiest thing to put yourself out there. But I want to encourage you that God has a purpose for community in your life. Amen. Put your heads down right now. Just take a moment and bow. We bow because out of reverence for the Holy Spirit and for the Lord. And if you know you have trouble with new friends and community, I want to pray for you today. Maybe if you have trouble confessing to one another and you just feel like I can't trust people, I want to pray for you right now. Would you lift your hand? Just be honest today. Would you trust me right now? Lift your hand and just be real and be honest. Thank you. Come on, so many hands being raised. I want to challenge you that God is for you. The people of God are for you.